All right, Leviticus 20, verse 7. A tough command, uh, two, two tough commands. He says, Leviticus 20, <laughs> verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore. That's tough in and of itself. Now he says, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Now that's an authoritative signature on that. I'm the Lord your God. Clean it up. <laughs> that's what he's saying. Now, that's a message that has been lost to modern Christianity, is sanctification. It's the job of every Christian to continue to sanctify. You're not perfect yet. You won't be tomorrow either, but keep working on it. <laughs> that's the goal, is to continue cleaning up. That spiritual growth means that you can identify some things this year that you didn't know were sin last year. Now, that's a good thing. That means you're progressing. How do we do this? First Peter, First Peter 1. First Peter 1, verse 15. I can't give you any pat answer how to do it. It's going to be... Um, you know, cover all every everything inconclusively. However, you just start somewhere. That's like a kid. You tell the kid to clean the room up. Every kid's got a disaster of a room. You tell them to clean up. They say, "Well, where do I? Start? How do I do that?" Well, start right where you are and start cleaning. <laughs> and as you move, clean a path. You do the same with your spiritual life. Wherever you are, you start cleaning there. And then move forward, and you'll have more to clean. <laughs> First Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. How? In all manner of conversation. That's a very good way to start. Make sure the conversation is clean. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, that's a good one that everybody can work on is the conversation you understand what conversation means it means words coming out of your mouth <laughs> but it means more than just the words out of your mouth it means the life you live how people can look at you and read who you are as a christian our life should say something as well as our words don't get into the phony baloney buy into the phony baloney that you can just live as a christian and that's good enough no, words need to come out of your mouth to prove it. People are not just going to fall under conviction because they see you acting right. You need to preach it. <laughs> Amen. That's right. <laughs> Be holy. That's one of the steps that a Christian can take. We've seen that word holy and we say, oh, that's so high and mighty. I'll never achieve that. Well, you could achieve a good conversation, a holy conversation. That one we can do. He says all manner. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Best way to keep your conversation clean is don't get it confused with wicked conversations. <laughs> you know, you pick up the way and the manner of speaking of those you're around. I, I, I'm a Southerner, you know, and I sound like a Southerner. <laughs> I'm originally from here and grew up in Memphis. That's even more of a hick. And then and then I, I transferred with FedEx up to Rochester, New York. Talk about standing out like a sore thumb. <laughs> but you start picking up the way they talk. I came back from New York and they thought I sounded like a Yankee. Of course, I didn't, but they thought I did. <laughs> But I remember I, the FedEx station was right across the street from Burger King. And I had worked, you know, 15 hours and was wore out. And I went in and I made my order. And the girl behind the counter said, what? And so I gave her my order again. I'll tell you, it was three or four times she asked me what. And I didn't understand why she couldn't get my order. And finally she said, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> We talk different. A Christian should talk different. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. He said, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You can fake it for a while. 
you can try to have your own hidden set of friends that are wicked. And you can go talk with them and, you know, take part in what their lifestyle is. But at some point it rubs off when you're not ready. You don't realize you've changed, but you've changed. He says it'll corrupt good manners. I just say, hey, why was this person around evil speakers? I'll tell you why. I had to turn the TV on. <laughs> you can't. I'll tell you another one. You can't walk through the mall. You can't walk through a store without them pumping in some evil communication into you. The music. You didn't choose that music. They chose it for you. Words are important. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, verse 34. Matthew 12, verse 34. Jesus speaking here to the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, O generation of vipers, what a way to talk to people. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, people know that, whether they know the verse for it or not. They know that if you're speaking one way, it reveals what type of heart you have. It reveals what's in you. And a Christian, there are certain things that shouldn't come out of their mouth because it shouldn't be in their heart. <laughs> he says, Jesus speaking here, he says, evil people can't speak good things. Now, I've heard him say that before. I've heard him say something good. I remember some guy saying, praise the Lord, and you could tell when it came out of his mouth, it was just foreign and it didn't feel right to him. And it didn't sound right either. <laughs> you can tell when it's genuine and when it's fake. Okay, that's why we've got to sanctify. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. People say that uh, they don't like the Old Testament because it's a bunch of rules. I'm sorry, there's more rules in the New Testament. <laughs> he says in Ephesians 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That is, you're responsible by your speech for how the person who hears it grows in their life. That puts a heavy weight on us. He says, you're supposed to be saying things that ministers grace to the hearer. Mm. That's uh, We're going to have to give account for it, obviously. He didn't say, I uh, I wish he had put a little salutation on the beginning of that and said it would be a good idea if you tried this. <laughs> but he didn't. This is a direct command. He says, let no corrupt communication. That is, it's not up for discussion. We can't negotiate this one with God. This is what he expects. Actions. Look at Galatians 1. Galatians 1, verse 13. Your actions are part of your conversation, what you do and what you don't do. He says, Galatians 1, 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. Now he's going to explain what he means by this conversation. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it. There he said his actions of persecuting and killing people was a conversation. I'd imagine it is a conversation. <laughs> if you'll live right, it'll cause some conversation too. If you live wicked, it causes conversation in the other direction. He says, I was persecuting the Christians. That was my conversation, my way of living, my manner of life. Look at it in James, James chapter 3. James 3, verse 13. He says, Who is a wise man 
and endued with knowledge among you. That just sounds sarcastic. Maybe he doesn't mean it sarcastic, but I, I read that and I always think he's being sarcastic. Who out there thinks they're wise <laughs> among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, not words, his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, we don't often think of wisdom as being meek, but wisdom is from God, not from man. Man doesn't come up with wisdom. He comes up with crafty um, philosophies, but not wisdom. That's God's. So if you're going to get it from God and it's true wisdom, you better be meek. You have to be humble because you didn't come up with it. He did. <laughs> First Peter 2. First Peter 2, verse 12. First Peter 2, 12. He says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they're lying, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Hmm. That tells me one day your conversations will be replayed at the judgment seat. Hmm. Now, you might not see the result of it right now. But if you'll speak right and act right, one day that itself is a witness at the judgment. Uh, God is going to call everybody on the carpet at some point saved or lost, and we have to give account. It's easy to think of that when we're in church. <laughs> it's not. I'll tell you when it's not easy to think of that. When you're wore out, you work 12 hours a day. And you're starving. <laughs> then it's hard to control that little bitty mouth. <laughs> it's hard at that point. But God doesn't put any exceptions in there about if you don't really feel it. If you've wore out and you, you no, we're to do it 24-7. Hmm. He says, uh, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. That is, God's going to visit this thing one day. And it will glorify God regardless of what they did with it. They may have discounted what you had to say about God. They may have discounted what you said about righteousness. And you don't think God got any glory from that because no one uh, fell under conviction from it. However, there's coming a day they'll be under conviction at the judgment. And he says that day of visitation, it'll come out. First Peter 3. Like street yes, many things, right? Yeah. First Peter 3, First Peter 3, verse 1, it says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they, may, uh, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That is, people will learn things by how you act. He's saying right here, somebody's married, obviously, to an unsaved person. He's saying you don't have to divorce them. Maybe what God intends is you to live right and respond correctly and through that win them without having to preach to them. There are some people it's not your position to preach to. I know that's an odd thing to hear a preacher say. <laughs> it, if you're at work and the boss doesn't want any talking, you don't talk. Just live right. Act right. Do right. That in and of itself will say a lot. James 2, James 2, verse 24. James 2, verse 24. He says, James 2, 24, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, of course, I'm not using this doctrinally. Doctrinally, he's speaking to the Jews. But he's saying here, how man's going to justify you, he's going to add, connect dots, is this way, by your works, what you do. You might say and act like you're some great Christian, 
and then you run out and start stealing stuff and doing, you know, living wickedly, they're not going to say he's just as claiming to be a Christian. They're going to say, no, he ain't. He's a liar is what he is. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews 13. He says, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Ouch. He didn't know anything about America. <laughs> every ad, yeah, every advertisement on the TV is designed to make you start coveting something. You deserve this. Reward yourself. And, you know, this is the new greatest invention or improvement that you really were missing out on, even though you didn't know what it was. <laughs> he says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Mm. You know, whatever you've got, the junk you have right now, there was a point you did not have that. <laughs> Reflect back and be content. God is good at giving us junk. <laughs> We moved down here when we moved down from uh, Rochester. I had just begun filling up a house, an apartment. And so we had all this furniture and good junk. We thought it was good junk. And we just gave it away. We were in a hatchback. That's all we could take. Gave it all away. And then our house has been completely refurbished. I don't know how many times since that time. God can give you junk and if you look back over your lifetime, you'll have seen it replace itself over and over and over. Be content. If he hadn't given you the junk you want right now, just hold on. It'll come. It'll come. <laughs> Be content. He says, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now you can always be content with that. If you're saved, you've got Jesus Christ with you, regardless of what situation or position you're in. He's with you. Now, if he's with you, he says, I'll not leave you. Hmm. Philippians, Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. He says, for our conversation is in heaven. Oh, man. Did you know the things you were saying the other day is in heaven? It's being uh, echoed in the throne room. That's a scary thought. Some of the things you said, all of heaven heard. Hold your place. I'll come right back there. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 1. He says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, somebody's watching you. Who are these witnesses he's talking about? Chapter 11. You know who's in chapter 11? This is the Hall of Faith. That's all the Old Testament characters who lived right. He says they're witnessing your life. Yeah, and our conversation is going on in heaven as we're having it on earth. Philippians 3, we'll finish our verse. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christians' conversations used to always be about that. When do you think he's coming back? <laughs> How long you think we got? <laughs> now, if you're a real Christian, that's the conversation you want to have is one day we're getting out of this mess. <laughs> and really, it won't be long. Ecclesiastes, there's an Old Testament book, Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 20. This is a tough one to obey. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 20. <laughs> As the Democrats begin to take, I mean, the, the corrupt policy. 
politics is very disappointing. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. You're going to be disappointed at um, the backroom deals and the crookedness. It's going to be very tempting to open your big mouth and say something about it. <laughs> he says, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 20. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought. Ooh. That is, don't let it come out of your mouth. It can't come out of your mouth if it wasn't in your brain to begin with. Okay, so shortcut it. Don't let it in the brain. Then you know it can't come out your mouth. <laughs> and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. That is, it's going to come out. The birds, the birds of the air. The, the Bible uses certain things as a, as a theme, as a way of telling you what God thinks of something. And these themes will carry all the way through the Bible. If you want to know what that bird is, it's an unclean devil. All the way through the Bible. I'll give you an example. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 32. Thirteen thirty-two. Well, let's back up to 31. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, that is a fact. You start making any progress for God, you know who gets interested? The devil. You start doing right, it doesn't mean the devil's going to leave you alone. It means he's going to turn up the heat. That's one sign you're headed the right way is if you're feeling opposition. Otherwise, you're going along with the course of this world. Look at Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Revelation 18, verse 2. This is the downfall of Babylon in the tribulation. He says this. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hole of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's uh, those demonic beasts that come out in the tribulation. He's calling them birds right there. Hmm. Bird of the air will tell the matter. You not only have the saints in heaven that are observing your conversation, you've got the accuser of the brethren, the devil, who's watching what comes out of your mouth too. You know, that's his job, is to accuse you night and day before the throne, just like he did with Job. Yes. So we have to be careful what comes of our mouth, out of our mouth so that we encourage others, but also so we don't give any ammunition to the devil. To cut our head off with <laughs> Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians two. Second Corinthians two, verse eleven. He says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. No, they all say Apple. Um <laughs> This world is so full of devices, and I get a kick out of it. They use the word device. <laughs> That's what they call it. Now, when I was a kid, we didn't have all of these devices. I, I, I would have never seen that verse fulfill itself until this day and age, where every kid's got 25 devices, and they call them that. And most of them are great tools to contact the wickedness of the devil. Now, he's... We're not ignorant of his devices. He says it in the Bible right there. But I'll guarantee you most people are. You tell them to sit down with a pen and paper and list the devices the devil uses. And they can't do it or it's a very short list. I'll tell you what's more important than that, though. 
That's a generalization. Sometime, I don't know that you ought to write it on a piece of paper, but think about it. The devices the devil uses to sidetrack you. Because everybody's got some besetting sin that's special to them, and the devil knows it. Identify that one and be on the lookout for it, because the devil's going to set that trap regularly. He says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30. First Corinthians 11, verse 30. He says, let's back up to verse 29. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. He says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That is, we're supposed to be wise as Christians. God doesn't want you to remain a baby all your life spiritually. <laughs> you, that, that's why the Bible's so big. You know, the, the very basic, most elementary lesson for a person to learn is you're a Christian now. There's one handbook, the Bible. And you see how big that thing is? <laughs> You're supposed to read it. If you read from the beginning all the way to the end, you've gotten an education. Now, that's by design. You'll get to the end of it and you'll think, hey, I'm missing some of those details that I started with at the beginning. And so you start over. And by the time you've read it through 20 or 30 times, you realize that you're starting to learn something and you need to read it through about 300 times more. <laughs> that's the way it is this this is uh something he says don't be uneducated don't be ignorant paul often comes in and he says i would not have you be ignorant brethren <laughs> i wonder what he would think of the modern church if he came and visited are we ignorant or are we wise all right i lost my place first corinthians where did i say uh, 11 verse 30 uh okay 11 um uh, where am I? Yes, 29. I started in 29. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Ooh, not in church. <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> That's what he means. Yeah. Our actions can cause us to reap the ultimate punishment, death. For a Christian. Now, the ultimate punishment for a Christian is falling way short of what punishment this lost world is going to go through. If we have to stand before the judgment and give account for ourselves, that's going to be painful, but not as painful as going and spending eternity in hell. Hmm. One day he says, I'm going to call in the records and I'm going to settle up accounts. This is a public vow before God and man, this Lord's Supper that he's been talking about. And God takes it very serious. He says, if you're going to promise me something, I expect you to fulfill it. Hmm. That's the actions we take. He says in the Old Testament, it's better to not vow a vow than to make a vow and not keep it. Why? Because a vow is a promise between you and the creator of this universe. You'll live or act a certain way. And he takes it serious. Well, I would expect that because he promised me some things too. I'm counting on him keeping his word when he says, I'll have everlasting life. I would expect him to hold me to mine as well. Hmm. Acts chapter 5. Acts 5, verse 4. Acts 5, verse 4. God's more keenly aware of and interested in what man says and does than man gives him credit for. Acts 5, verse 4. Ananias and Sapphira. 
Whilst it remained, they had lied about selling some land and giving money, and they wanted everybody to think they were great big givers. <laughs> Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine own heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Ooh. He says right there, man heard the lie, but the lie wasn't to man. It was a lie to God. Ooh. So what we say goes direct to God's ears. That's important. Now I'm going to show you something in this verse. You don't need this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> what modern preachers will do is they'll tell you, you're not under the law, you're under grace until it pays my bills. Then you are under the law to give me 10%. <laughs> but look at our verse. This is a verse on giving. He says, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? That would have been a perfect time for him to put in there about tithing, wouldn't it? <laughs> Bible doesn't say anything about it. That's Old Testament law. And the tithe didn't 10% anyway. Okay, that's something extra. You can go study on that for a while. <laughs> Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verse 2. Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verse 2. These guys are having a bad day. You ever have a bad day? Sure, we've all had bad days. It's dangerous when you have a bad day. Because you can make a bad day into a bad life. <laughs> Go visit the jail sometime and find out what one bad decision has cost somebody for a lifetime. He says, Numbers 14, verse 2, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Who's this against? Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Oof. Look down at verse 28. God's fed up. Verse 28. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Ooh, that was careless, flippant statements they were making. And God said, is that what you want? I'll give it to you. And we know that's exactly what he did. He says, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that uh, were numbered among you according to the whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doesn't say they murmured against God. Back in verse 2, they were murmuring against Moses and Aaron. Those were the leadership team that was uh, forcing them to do this or do that. And they were complaining about that. Now that's a lesson to us. When we start complaining about the rules and the regulations we have over us, God takes it personal. Who's responsible for putting rules and regulations and people in charge over you? God is. God controls a Christian's life 100%. You don't get a job and you don't lose a job. God gives it or God takes it. So if you're going to complain about it, God takes it serious. Here he's going to kill off uh, most everybody. Look at Numbers 20. I got to shut up. Man, this is a lot longer than I thought it was. Um, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1. <laughs> James don't care. 2 <laughs> Timothy 1. That's right. 2 <laughs> Timothy 1, verse 3. He says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee 
in my prayers night and day. Now, that's a good action you can take. See, he's forcing his mouth to do something now that's helpful. Okay, sometimes you'll realize, hey, I've got a bad habit of saying this or saying that, or I got a critical spirit and I start talking when I shouldn't be talking. Fix it. Reverse it. Here's how to do it. Make your mouth start saying things it ought to say. Find somebody to pray for. Find a need that's bigger than your perceived need. You know, we have perceived needs. Usually it's baloney. (laughs) Because if it was a true need, God's not a real good God if he hadn't given it to you. Mm. He said he's going to supply all your needs. And if you really needed it, he would have supplied it. So he's true or you're true. Obviously it's he. (laughs) Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 10. Revelation 12, 10. Here's the way it ends up. Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, And the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, the devil does do that. He comes up and accuses you. It's really a bad deal. He sets the trap for you, then turns around and tattles on you. (laughs) He's wicked. Watch out for him. If a person you knew on earth did that to you, they wouldn't be able to do it twice. You'd have their number. The same is true with the devil. When we catch him setting a trap for us, be aware of it. Watch that device. Mark it down. Don't let him do it twice. But one day, it's all going to be said and done, and he's the one going down. He says, uh, which accused them before our God day and night. Look at Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 10. I don't have time to give you the um, any of the rest of this good stuff. (laughs) If you'll search it out, do this sometime. I want you to search two phrases, the phrase night and the phrase day, in that order. And then reverse the order, day and night. And you'll find that God works from one direction and the devil works from the other direction. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. One day the devil gets his and will come out on top. But in the meantime... Be aware he's out to get you. Paul says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 